Shalom, Rabbi Kurt Landry here. Listen, I am so enjoying these ancient principles in kingdom authority. You know, um, we try to respond to you, um, really, our body. We're all part of the body of Messiah, body of Christ. And, um, you know, we're not here for ourselves. We're here to serve you. And so I love it when you ask questions. And But what it does is a lot of the questions are things where I'm having to circle back. Like your question today, we're almost at the end of the dire straits coming into the ninth of Av. And, it's, and your question is, we're almost out of the dire straits. You often say that we can know when something is of the enemy because it always overplays his hand. What do you mean? Well, in the last podcast of Ancient Principles and Kingdom Authority, I talked about the fact that there are seasons when you're going through a dire strait. I kind of use an example of being like on a sailboat. I actually remember this because when we lived in Seattle, went out a friend of mine's sailboat. We were out in Emerald Bay, and um, the boat was actually docked in Lake Washington. So in order to come in, for those of you that live there, Christy and I lived there for 14 years, but you'd have to go through the Ballard Locks. And I love that. You'd go through, and there's Ray's Boathouse, one of my favorite restaurants there, as we'd be coming in on the left, and you're coming into the locks. And um, the, when you're going through the locks, it's fine and dandy if it's not crowded, and it's, and it's all good. But when it is crowded and it's a storm, then uh, it's windy, then you really got to be at the top of your game. And that kind of describes the dire straits because what happens is once the storm comes, then what you do is all the traffic, the boat traffic that's out on Emerald Bay that's, that's coming in from the Straits of Juan de Fuga, all that. Anytime there's storms, then what happens is they're going to move from the bay into Lake Washington to be able to harbor the boats and dock them to get them out of the storm. And so what happens is... Thus, you have the storm, and then the narrow place becomes heavy traffic. And I've been there. And it's, it's one thing going through uh, the locks there at Ballard with two or three other boats. But when you've got, you know, a bunch of us going through all different sizes, and, uh, and then you have the wind moving everything around, it truly is a dire strait. So um, your question is, how do I know with the enemy when he overplays his hand? When the enemy overplays his hand, one of the things you can do during the dire straits is journal, okay? And what you can do is just take, take a piece of paper and, and write, just put a line right down the middle and say, you know, strong on one side and weak on the other, okay? And so while you're going through this dire strait, this three week, or you can do it right now. Just go back and think over the last three weeks. So when the storm came and we made a decision, let's say, to go through the locks and go to Lake Washington to dock the boat in a safe place, we know once we get through that we can get in there, that there'll still be a storm, but it won't be anything like it was on the bay. So what triggered, what were the mental, what were the mental triggers that caused you to go from being strong in your faith to weak and even going into fear. And what I would do is I'd list those down. And then what happens is you can identify in your life the, the real thing about overplaying your hand is what happens is once the enemy, it's kind of like with animals. You know, people know with, with canines that if you show fear, then they actually smell the fear. And when they smell the fear, then what happens is it causes the dog, canine, to operate in fear. The scent of fear causes him to operate, and it makes him defensive. And that's what we're talking about in the dire straits. The Lord wants to take you through each season of the dire straits to, so to say, polish you to where when I gave the analogy of your body, soul, spirit, and Holy Spirit, when you're on the boat, the Lord wants you in the middle of the storm to be able to, like Jesus in the boat during the storm, he was asleep in the boat. He wants your body to stay in the lounge chair, remember, with the drink and the umbrella. 
He wants your mind, will, and emotions to be peaceful. He wants your spirit, man, to trust the Holy Spirit who's steering the boat through the locks and not get fearful and tell the Holy Spirit to sit down and say, I'll handle this because I'm afraid. So the key, when the enemy overplays his hand, the enemy will actually, this is a little bit deep, but I want you to follow me. The enemy will actually, what he does is familiar, fearful things will pop up. And when they pop up, you can overcome them, also cut them off, not just you, but your children. Okay. Uh, I, I'm, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you an example in, uh, let me see how much time I've got. I've got good time. Okay. In our family, there is a, it, it's a bizarre, it's, but it's a generational curse. Okay. My wife has it, had it. My wife had it. I've had it. And Megan has have, had it. And we've even seen it try to play out in our grandchildren. And it's a silly thing, but this is how it works. Something special is coming. We're going to celebrate. You may have had this in your life. Okay. Uh, uh, I can remember when Megan was little. It was like, okay, she was, I can't remember, seven or eight years old. In fact, we were in Seattle. And uh, at this time, in fact, we were at a park in Issaquah. Uh, we used to live up on the plateau up above Issaquah. And she wanted to have this special birthday party at the park. And, and she wanted all of her friends to come and to get everybody, you know, gathered up. Turns out everybody could come. She was so excited. She had certain games and things that she wanted to do. And us being good parents and me being a daddy, I wanted to say, I'm going to make this happen. Okay. And so here it comes. We get everything set up food, games, everything, the place at the park back then you had to get it kind of reserved. Everything's good to go, except now a torrential rain uh, weather pattern comes into Seattle. Duh. You know, this is her birthdays in April and it's raining. And, and so there was always this pattern that anytime we planned something special for Christy when she was little and older and me, and then Megan, that anytime something special, something would come to so quote unquote rain on our parade. And we realized it was spiritual because it happened almost like every time. Like I would have, like I'd win a, a prize or, or, or a goal at work and, um, and something would happen and something would always come to like, just to, to something negative to steal the joy of the event. So we're watching this and we, we started realizing this is a spirit. Now to get back to our birthday party, Christy and I prayed and God is our witness. We prayed at that party and literally there was like a portal above the park where there was clear blue skies and gray clouds everywhere. And literally we celebrated with those children <laughs> and it, uh, it, we prayed and the rain stopped. And once we cleaned up and left, the rain started to pour down again. But, but the pattern was, is that we call it the party pooper spirit, where anytime we have something great that's going to happen, then we saw it starting to happen with our grandchildren, where things would happen, and then this negative stuff would happen. So you see, that's kind of that, that like, where did that come from? So I don't want to go into the personal thing, but we actually went through deliverance, found out where that came from to steal our joy in our family line. And it turns out that it was from our parents and, and choices they made. And we cut those off. And I can tell you now we're not battling those things anymore. But during the dire straits, if you'll, if you'll make that list and you can say, what, what thing triggered? What, what triggered me? Okay, um, somebody asked me to do something, um, you know, ask them to help them. Let's say financially, somebody asked, and, and you were fearful. You felt led to do it, but the amount of the help. So where does that poverty come from? Where did that fear of financial lack come from in your life? Spend time, seek the Lord, pray, pray in tongues, go back in time and find out, and then come out of agreement with it. Come out of agreement with it in Jesus' name. You know, find out where, where, that, where that spot is. Where, where did that come from? And um, it will really help you. 
Okay, let's see. Your next question is, that was the question of overplaying his hand. The enemy always overplays his hand at areas God wants to heal. Okay? So if he's going to overplay his hand, it's kind of like he tests the weak spots because the Lord wants to heal the weak spots. Okay? The next question is, how do we know that we're in the center of God's will uh, even when we see obvious displays all around of, of our personal life and others say otherwise. Well, um, let's take an ancient principle with some kingdom authority for you right now. Anytime you make a choice to start to head down the path of God's will, the resistance will come. So the otherwise sh- symptoms Anytime you start going down the right path, the resistance is your confirmer. If you're going down a path and it's all rosy and nothing's pushing back, more than likely it's the enemy just leading you with breadcrumbs down to a trap. And soon there'll be a hole with, so to say, a net over it with leaves and you're going to be trapped in a pit. Because if everything's going too smooth, I'm always a little bit concerned. Is this a trap? Because anytime you remotely start to turn your life toward the will of God, then that's when the fight starts. And the key is once you can actually show the enemy that, you know what, you're not going to back off, that, that's the key to experience. Um, someone was uh, asking me a question the other day. Um, we went to a graduation party, and one of the young men was asking me about um, uh, what's different now at my age of 68. He's in his 40s, and he's successful in business. And when I was in 40, when I was in business, that's the age I was at. And um, he was saying, what do, you, what do you think the biggest difference is now? And, and I can tell you, I mean, I, I didn't hesitate. I said, I know the difference. The difference is experience. See, when I was 40, I knew what to do, I knew how to do it, and in my field, I was doing it well. And that got me up one level of result. But now, I'm probably not as good as what I used to do. I know what to do, but I have the experience to do it better. Because experience is the greatest teacher. And so what you have to understand that is during the dire straits, it is, if you look at this three-week period of time, it's really kind of like a spiritual master class to show you where your weaknesses are so that you can overcome them, make changes into your habits and patterns so that you don't fear them anymore. And so I think the biggest difference between me and the 40-year-old that I was speaking with, and, and I see so much of myself in him, and he's been you know, with me here at House of David for years. The the difference is he doesn't have the experience yet. He will. But he doesn't have the experience I have at 68 where I just don't sweat the small stuff like I did at 40. At 40, my mind, will, and emotion could had I had a great imagination of all the destruction and the crazy and the bizarre stuff that could happen to stop what, you know, I was doing even though I was born again and had faith. But at 68, I just don't entertain. I don't know if I've lost energy or what, but I just don't entertain those thoughts. It's just like, eh, it's not going to happen. And all the bizarre, weird stuff is still going to keep coming at you. It never stops. But if you're going to overcome, you need to know your whole goal, if we go back to the boat analogy, is to let the Holy Spirit with the tiller Let my spirit man trust in that. Let my soul stay in the lounge chair (laughs) and to be able to follow after him. That that's really, really the key. Let's see. I've got just a few minutes here. I'll have one more question. How faithful is our God? And can we put, can we put him into remembrance of this faithfulness so that we can overcome the spirit of fear and confusion that was tied to keeping us stuck or tied in the old season? Absolutely. First of all, the only way to learn how to trust God is to have a testimony. So what happens is you face the fear. 
you put God into remembrance. The scripture says, when you go into the courts of heaven, put God into remembrance of his word. Say, Father God, your word says, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Every tongue speaking against me from the outside, in my head, anywhere that speaks against your will, I condemn it. That's the inheritance of the saints. I'm a saint. That's my inheritance. I cut it off. I choose to take baby steps forward. I'm going to crawl, walk, run into my future. And Lord, go with me, hold my hand, guide me, teach me, because I have learned and decreed, may it be written in the courts of heaven this day, that I choose to follow you, not my own will, but let thine will be done. In Yeshua's name. Well, God bless you. So good to have you on Ancient Principles and Kingdom Authority and look forward to seeing you in the next podcast. Shalom.